You know, last week, uh, during prayer time, Doug brought up the, the idea of praying for these Syrian people that are uh, being persecuted, these Syrian Christians are being persecuted by Islamic people. And we brought up the idea of what was going on in Kenya. And if you remember the story of what was going on in Kenya, in Nairobi, in an up, upscale mall, uh, Westgate Mall, uh, there was a group of Muslim terrorists that walked into the mall and uh, they told all the Muslims to leave the mall and then they began killing people. Uh, the idea was that uh, the way they spun it on the news was that they wanted to kill all the non-Muslims. Immediately I, I began to roll my eyes and begin to think that is it really the non-Muslims they want to kill or is it the Christians they want to kill? Because if you, uh, if, if you look at uh, what's going on in this world today, you, you, you see a lot of persecution uh, against Christians. If you remember when Saddam Hussein was uh, the leader of Iraq, uh, the Christians lived in relative peace. that They could worship wherever they want to. When Saddam Hussein was deposed, uh, they began persecuting Christians. Now there's virtually no church in Iraq. And you, you see the same thing happening in Afghanistan. Christians are being persecuted. You see what's happening in Syria. Uh, they wiped out, it was a couple weeks ago, they wiped out a whole town of Christians. And they, they were Aramaic-speaking Christians. And, and all throughout the Middle East, uh, Christians are being persecuted. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the Christian church, they, they call it the Coptic church in Egypt. The reason they call it the Coptic church is Coptic is the ancient language of Egypt. So they're called Coptic Christians. Well, the Coptic Christians built a church. Uh, the expense was 8 million Turkish pounds. And there's a law in Egypt that says that you cannot have two places of worship within 100 meters of each other, about 110 yards. So, a group of Islamic people went to an apartment and hung out a sign <laughs> saying that they've set up a mosque in this apartment. So the authorities came by the next day and told the Christians that they have to leave. So on and on you see this persecution all across the Middle East. Now in America people are beginning to wonder what's going to happen. My daughter and I went out to the Mall of America a few years ago. It's an absolutely beautiful mall. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. But there's a lot of Somalian people that live in Minneapolis. Somalian people. Somalia is a, a country on the east coast of Africa. And it's all Islamic. So they're concerned about the Somalian people that live in the area of Minnesota that they might begin to terrorize people in the Mall of America. What's our response as Christians? And so I, I decided because of that question that Doug brought up and this idea of what's going on in the world, I decided to do a series on Islam. So, if you've got your Bibles, open up to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. John is on, on the Isle of Patmos. And the year is 95 AD. And he's writing to the church at Ephesus. This is what he has to say. This is the Lord speaking. John has given this, been given this vision by the Lord. These are the Lord's words. Yet I have this against you. You have forsaken your first law. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to remove you and remove your lampstand from its place. Father, we thank you for your uh, holy and righteous word. Lord, as we come to a, an issue that uh, has practicality, our Father, I pray that you lead and guide this discussion. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. A Tertullian was a, uh, he was an early church father who died in the year 225 A.D. A is uh, noted for this saying. He said that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I agree with that to, a, to an extent. I mean, you see people that die for Jesus Christ. Somehow that inspires us. We want to give more to Jesus. We want to live more 
because we see martyrs. You walk, you, you walk through that book of, of the Vox's book of martyrs, and you read the stories of how Christians have suffered. Uh, you're inspired by that. The other side of the coin is this. If you've got enough martyrs, you're not going to have a church. Ephesus was a strong church at one time. And uh, it's in eastern Turkey. The year is about 1453 A.D. Now you remember the Byzantine Empire divides the Roman Empire. you got the Byzantine and then you got the Roman Empire. Now the Byzantine Empire controls all of Turkey. Uh, there was a sultan by the name of Ahmed II. Ahmed II went into what is called the western half of Istanbul, Turkey. It's controlled by the Byzantine Empire. Well, he entered into that city, took over that part of the city, set up a castle overlooking the Straits of Bosporus. And any ships that came down that Bosporus Straits had to pay an exorbitant fee to Ahmed II. And so there was one ship that didn't, decided not to do it. It was a Venetian ship sailing for Venice. And uh, so they bombed the ship. They unloaded some cannonballs on it. And then they took the men and they executed all the men on that ship. They terrorized the area. Now, the emperor of the, of the Byzantine Empire is a man by the name of Constantine XI. And Constantine XI is Pan. He wants help from the Western Empire, the Roman Empire. But if you remember, if you know church history, there's this, this tension between the East and the West, the Byzantines and the Romans. And they argue about things like the Philippe uh, controversy. And if you ever study church history, it's, it's a controversy about how, how the Holy Spirit, Spirit comes about. Does it come from the Father only, or does he come about from the Son and the Father? So they get into these theological arguments. So there's this tension between the East and the West. And so the West, the Holy Roman Empire, decides not to help the Byzantines. So the Byzantines are all, they're all cluttered together. The men, women, and the children are all huddled together. And you see Ahmed and the forces of Ahmed are pounding on the walls. They breach the walls and they decide they're going to take over the city. Now there's rumors going about that there's going to be enforced reinforcements coming from Venice or somewhere in the world. Somebody's going to come and help these people, but help does not come. They're living in absolute terror. So Constantine the Eleventh says, fight for your faith and your country. Fight for your faith and your country. The problem is Ahmed is victorious. He destroys all of, all of the, the, the buildings, and, and he, he destroys the, the churches and whatnot, and the Muslims take over Constantinople. They rename it Istanbul. From there, they take over all of Turkey. And if you remember Turkey, this is where John writes these seven, to the seven churches in western Turkey. They're all taken over by Islam. You're, Philadelphia, Pergamon, Sardis, uh, Smyrna, uh, Laodicea, Thyatira, and Ephesus. Now, I've been to the city of Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna is a met metropolitan area. It's, just, it's a huge city. It was, it was, it, it, and in the book of Revelation, Jesus commends these people for being strong Christians. But now, there's virtually no Christians living in Smyrna. As a matter of fact, in Turkey, it's like one half of one percent of the people in Turkey are Christians. Even when I worked in Turkey, uh, we, we uh, tried to build churches and sell literature and this kind of things. Uh, there was so much harassment by the police upon the church there that the church actually asked us to please leave the country because you're being you're causing this persecution on us. So we left Turkey uh, a week early than we anticipated. The point is this: churches can die. It died in Ephesus. This is what Jesus says. If you don't repent, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to remove you, and I'm going to remove the lampstand. Jesus is warning us that you can lose the church. Churches can and do die. Is it going to happen in America? I don't know. Sometimes you look to, to Europe, as an example, now it's been 30 years, almost 30 years since my wife and I have been to, to Germany. We were just little kids when we were there. So. <laughs> but it's been 30, and a lot, has a lot has happened since the last time we were in Germany. Last time we were in Germany, there were 50,000 Muslims in Germany. Today, there's 4 million 
Muslims living in Germany. And, and in Germany, as all over Western Europe, the church is dying. And churches are being abandoned. As a matter of fact, last year in a, in a, in a German city called Duis, Duisburg, uh, there were six Roman Catholic churches that were abandoned. People are abandoning Christianity. And so when you see these churches abandoned, they're, they're bought up, they're taken over by Islamic people, and the churches are converted into mosques. And the people of Europe just look at it and say, well, you know, it's a place of worship. Uh, we really don't care about Christianity. Uh, at least somebody's getting some use out of it. So they turn it into an Islamic mosque, and, uh, and, and the people are fine, fine with that. In, in Europe, in, in, in England, there's 1,700 mosques in, 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 in England. There, there's, there's actually um, places in England that, that are so controlled by Islamic people that the, the, the people of Britain are, are, are even terrified to go there. But they're the, the building mosques at an alarming rate in Europe. And, and, and you, you somewhat see what's going on in America. Uh, that when, when, when someone builds a mosque or takes over real estate, there's a concept in, uh, in Islam, in the Quran, they call it sacred soil. Once a piece of land has been taken over by Islamic people, it stays in the hands of Islamic people, and even real estate agents sell their houses to Islamic people under the proviso that the land will always stay with Islamic people. So that's the concept in the Quran, and that's one of the reasons that you'll never have peace in the Middle East. It's not going to happen. As a matter of fact, we go downstairs and we make jokes about it. They've come up with the Camp David Accord. Oh, they've come up with the Oslo Accord. Oh, they've got some new kind of peace agreement that's going to happen in the middle. It's not going to happen because of the concept in the Quran of the sacred soil. That land was controlled by Muslims. In the year 850, on or about 850, they built the Dome of the Rock upon the temple area in Jerusalem. That land, in the minds of Islamic people, is now Islam. It does not belong to Israel. It doesn't belong to anybody. It belongs to Islam. Because Muhammad was told by Allah that all the world belongs to Islamic people. The whole world. But Satan and his horde of demons have taken over. You are to go out and win these places. And once you've won them, they are in Islamic hands, and they will remain in Islamic hands. And as a matter of fact, when you build a mosque in, in a Muslim country, they call it a Dar al-Muslim. Dar meaning house, house of Islam. But when you build it in a non-Muslim country, it's a Dar al-Har, a, a house of war. So you, you, you put this mosque up in an area... That, that's not Muslim, so it becomes a house of more. And then you've got groups like the uh, CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relationship, constantly battling the system, trying to uh, emplace Islam into our country. And uh, I heard this, uh, I read this, uh, one of the, the, the books I read on, uh, on, on this issue is um, a book by Erwin Lutzer called uh, The Crescent and the, Portion, and, and the Shadow of the Cross. In that book, he, he says that uh, there are places in New York City uh, where they, uh, uh, they cut off traffic for, for Islamic people when they want to go to, want to, go to a mosque on, on Friday. And I've got to ask if there's a police officer that's ever worked in New York City, and maybe he can tell me if that's true or not, but that's what I've heard. But you see other examples of it. Uh, for example, in North Seattle, Washington, a public pool agreed to set up a swim time for Muslim women in which men, even lifeguards, are banned. In Hammerack, uh, Michigan, officials amended a noise ordinance to allow mosques to broadcast calls to prayer over loudspeakers, despite complaints that the Arab chants repeated five times a day are a nuisance. In Irvington, New Jersey, public schools agreed to close for mosque holidays, joining schools in Patterson and Trent, as well as ones in Dearborn, Michigan, that, is, that recognize Islamic holidays. In Fairfax, Virginia, public schools agreed to produce local TV announcements in Arabic and Farsi. Farsi is the language of Iran. Uh, in San Francisco, a court of appeals gave its blessings to a Muslim role-playing exercises in California public schools. In Kansas City Airport, officials agreed to install special wash basins in restrooms for Muslim taxi drivers who complained they couldn't easily wash their feet 
before praying. So they're out there battling for their rights. Um, there's one uh, theologian in Islam who said these words, that Americans can worship Allah now, or they can worship Allah later, but within a hundred years, America will be a Muslim country. So, Jesus warns us that the church can die. There's a threat of Islam. The question is, what do we do? What do we do as a Christian, as a church, as, as a Christian nation? What do we do? Some guy once said that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I love doing my FDR impression. But, but he's absolutely right. Fear can paralyze you. And Jesus told us over and over again not to fear. God is sovereign. God doesn't allow anything to happen that he doesn't want to happen. God loves Islamic people. There's a passage in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 19. It goes like this in verse 23. It says, In that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. The Assyrians will go to Egypt and the Egypts and the Egyptians to Assyria. The Egyptians and the Assyrians will worship together. In that day Israel will be the third along with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing on the earth. The Lord Almighty will bless them, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, Assyria, my handiwork, and Israel my inheritance. And what Isaiah is talking about is this time in the future. There's going to come a day when the church is going to be raptured out of the world, and then this seven-year tribulation period is going to happen. The tribulation period, not to leave anybody confused, tribulation period is a period where God wants to reach uh, the, is the people of Israel, bring them back to the Messiah. So there's the seven-year tribulation period, and the world's going to be transformed. And there's going to be numerous people saved, and Jesus is going to come back, set up this millennial kingdom. That's what he's referring to. That God's blessing is upon these Egyptian people. His blessing is also upon the Arabs. Egyptians are not Arabs. If you ever called an Egyptian an Arab, he would be offended. Egyptians are Egyptians, and Arabs are Arabs. But his blessing is upon the Egyptians. But his blessing is also upon the Arab people. If you remember, Abraham had two sons, Isaac, the child of promise, the child of Israel, but he had Ishmael as a son too. And Ishmael is um, uh, the forefather of all the Arabic people. So his blessing is upon these people. We are not to fear them, we are to love them because God's blessing is upon them. Uh, the other idea, as Americans, we need to protect our Constitution. Our Constitution is in our favor. There was a case in New Jersey a few years ago where a man from Lebanon, now I've, I've got a, a friend of mine, he's an Australian guy, we met on OM, and he and his wife and kids worked in Lebanon. Lebanon was this wonderful, peaceful country, the most beautiful country in the Middle East. I've never been there, but people tell me that have been there that that's the most beautiful country in the Middle East. Beirut is called the Paris of the Middle East. Beautiful country. Christians and Muslims living together for centuries. But the last 30, 40 years, there's this, this tremendous tension between the two. So that's what's going on in Lebanon. So this, this man from Lebanon comes to America. He starts beating his wife. Well, his wife takes him to court because he's beating her. Well, the defense argues that uh, under Sharia law, this man is allowed to beat his wife because he's practicing his religion. Well, the judge finds for the defense, and he's off scot-free. Of course, happily, a court of appeals overturns the decision. My point is this, that we are not a democracy. This isn't mob rule. This isn't mob voting. We're a republic. We've got a constitution. We've got laws on our side. We've, we've got a constitution that protects us from establishing a religion. We need, as Christians, always to vote for people that keep that constitution intact. 
because there are people out there that say the Constitution is an evolving document and you can twist and contort it to whatever your beliefs are. One of our strengths is going to be that Constitution. So we've got God who's sovereign, who loves Islamic people, who's going to bless them someday. We've got our Constitution to, to keep us strong. The other issue is simply this. We've got truth on our side. In Lutzer's book, he, he tells the story of a man by the name of Hikam. Hikam is a Lebanese fellow. And as I said before, there was always this ability for the Lebanese people to get along, whether they are Christians or Arab, but in the last 20, 30 years, they can't seem to get along. So Hikam is a little boy, and another boy, he's, he's an Islamic boy, he's hit in the head by a Christian boy. He is a nominal Christian. They're probably playing or whatever. He hits him in the head with a club. The club's got uh, nails in it. He's bleeding profusely. He's bleeding badly. <laughs> and he begins to have a disdain for Christians. So he and his brother decide to join the, the militants against the Christians, and they're fighting the Christians, and his brother is killed by Christians. So he hates Christians more than anything in this world and would love to get even with them. So, goes to college, there's, he takes a course in world religion. The church you're teaching the course is a woman. She starts reading from the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, you've got to love your enemies. And those words sink into his mind. That's not what the Quran teaches. That's not what I believe about Islam. That's not what Islam teaches me. This strange idea to love your enemies. Love it. Love those people that persecute you. He gets converted to Christ. Gives his life to Christ. My point is this. We need to engage these people. Not fear them, not hate them, but engage them. And I don't want to get political here, but I think sometimes our American foreign policies hurt us. And that you can talk to missionaries out on the, out on the field that are, that, are, that are working for Christ. A lot of times we're, we're making some mistakes in, in our foreign policy. And so the mission field in some sense has been closed off. You can't get any missionaries in Afghanistan, right? These places are hard to go into now. So God is bringing these people into our laps. We need to engage them. We need to love them and win them to Jesus Christ. You know, a few years ago was 9-11. Talking 13 years ago, 12 years ago, Islamic terrorists bombed the World Towers, trying to destroy our financial system. Well, right next to those twin towers was a worn-down factory, and the the Islamic people decided they were going to build a mosque there. Somewhat insensitive, after what Islam has done uh, to America, uh, they decided to call it Cordoba. Why do they call it Cordoba? Well, Cordoba was a city in Spain. And in the 8th century, the Moors came over and they conquered the city. And they built the most fabulous mosque. It was the third largest Islamic uh, building in the world. And they're proud of that. That's why they named it Cordoba. You see, th there are extremists in the Islamic world. Those that would take out the, the, the World Trade Towers, those that would build mosques like that, those that want to take over your country. But they're the minority. And the majority of Islamic people are moderates. And we sit here and wonder as Americans, well, why don't these moderates stand up and say something? These people are extremists. They're wrong. But they can't. Because the extremists follow the Quran the letter and the law of Quran. We'll talk more about the Quran in the ensuing weeks. But they follow the Quran. And if you go against these extremists, you're going against the Quran. You can't go against the Quran. You can be as moderate and as liberal as you want, but you're not a Muslim if you don't believe in the Quran. It's like, it'd, be, it'd be like saying, I'm a Christian. <laughs> I am a Christian. But I don't believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. See, it's a non sequitur. You can't say you're a moderate Islam and not follow the Quran. You don't follow these people who are following the Quran to the letter of the law. 
you will be punished according to Islamic society. So that's the problem. That's what you're dealing with when you're dealing with Islamic extremists vis-a-vis -vis moderates. The point is this. Jesus says that we, re need, we need to remain faithful. Be on guard. Because churches can end our loss. We need to be on guard. We need to recognize God's sovereignty, that God loves these Islamic people. He's going to bless them. We need to realize that our strength is our constitution. We need to elect people that believe in that document. And we also need to engage these people, love them, win them to Jesus Christ. I worked in Islamic countries. They, these people are open. They're open to Jesus Christ. This morning, I'm going to ask the elders to uh, come forward, and uh, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. Many years ago, I 